Hello and welcome back. This is a lecture for Plato's Apology. The Apology is a very important text in Western philosophy, history, and literature because it's the best record we have of the trial of Socrates. And so historians look at this text to try to figure out what Socrates was like as a person, what the Athenian court system was like, and what Athenian laws were. Literary scholars look at the Apology to try and distinguish Socrates' voice from Plato's. They analyze Socrates' rhetoric, his self-presentation, and all of the ways that Socrates uses language to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. In fact, there's a debate about what he was trying to accomplish all along. Is he genuinely trying to defend himself or is he purposely sabotaging his own defense to make a point? I mention this because there's so many different ways to read the Apology and different things to focus on. People in philosophy tend to read the Apology for the views that Socrates appears to espouse in the speech. And instead of asking, is Socrates really trying to win or lose? we tend to ask what ideas, insights, and arguments in the text are worth our attention even today? What does Socrates say in favor of those ideas? And what do we think we can say on behalf? On behalf of them or in response to them? And that's gonna be the focus of this lecture and our discussion in class. The first argument I want you to think carefully about is the cross-examination of Miletus that Socrates engages in. The charge is that Socrates is corrupting the youth of Athens by going around the city and questioning people in positions of power in front of everyone in the public space, essentially humiliating them, kind of like what he did to Euthyphro. The youth seem to really enjoy this kind of as a sport. And eventually, if you do this enough, you're going to piss off some powerful people, and they're going to do something to you. The trial of Socrates is not all that different from intellectual persecution today. Corrupting the youth is one of the scariest things to those in positions of power. We're currently fighting a war about indoctrinating young people with subversive ideas. People accuse professors in college of it. People accuse journalists have do it, people accuse authors, people accuse a lot of different kinds of writers, thinkers, and presenters with poisoning the minds of young people. People who question institution and individuals of power, for instance, those who question certain governments, policymakers, or the criminal justice system. People who are charged with threatening the stability of a society. One of the most common charges in other countries that look to keep tight control over individuals. And while not a lot of people are put to death today, there are calls for firings, there are death threats, there's doxing, there's arresting and jailing. The underlying human tendencies that led Socrates to do what he did and those in positions of power to prosecute him are with us to this very day. Now, the first argument I want you to think carefully about is the cross-examination of Miletus that Socrates engages in. Given that this was the charge against Socrates, Socrates presents a defense by trying to argue from premises that Miletus accepts himself to the conclusion that he is not guilty and not deserving of any punishment. Let's go step by step into that argument. One of the most powerful ways to argue against an opponent, especially in court, is to get them to accept certain premises and from those premises argue that they themselves are committed to a conclusion that they don't want to accept. And so that's precisely what Socrates is trying to do to Miletus in the cross-examination. Socrates first has Miletus accept that the people who surround him, who are closest to him, are the youth of Athens, 
precisely the people that Miletus claims are his victims. The next premise that Socrates has Miletus accept is that no person, at least no reasonable person, wants to be harmed. This is a premise that says that people generally are harm averse. They will not go out of their way to find ways to harm themselves. Next step, that if a person doesn't want to be harmed, then he's not going to deliberately or purposefully do things that make it likelier for people around him to harm him. So if I generally don't want to be harmed, then I'm not going to purposefully do something to make my best friends want to harm me in return. I might do it on accident, but I wouldn't try to do it deliberately. Now the charge is that Socrates deliberately harms the youth, according to Miletus. And given that that's the case, Socrates then has Miletus accept that harming people is a way to make it likelier that they will be wicked which makes it likelier that they will harm you in return. Notice that in this argument, Socrates doesn't seem to be saying that harming people guarantees that they're going to become wicked and guarantees that they're going to harm you back. Nothing in this argument says that all of these things must happen. Rather, it's an argument that says Generally speaking, it's likelier to happen. Harming people makes it likelier that they'll turn wicked, which makes it likelier that they will harm you back. You're increasing the chances of harm to yourself. You're increasing the chances that somebody will become wicked by harming them. And so, on the basis of the previous premises, Socrates has Miletus accept this kind of intermediate conclusion that since he doesn't want to be harmed, he won't be purposefully harming those close to him, since doing so makes it likelier for those people to harm him in return. And so the conclusion of Socrates' arguments, which is something that he thinks Miletus himself is committed to, is that Socrates isn't harming the youth purposefully at all. Either he's not harming them, or if he is harming them, he's not doing it purposefully. It's an accident. It's not intended. Either way, Socrates is not doing anything unjust. If you accidentally, without intention, do something wrong, you need to be educated and shown that you're wrong, but not punished for it. And if you don't do any harm in the first place, of course you haven't done anything unjust. That's Socrates' argument. Now I'm going to stop here and have you think a little bit about this argument. Write a little bit about it and bring it to class with you. Here are some of the discussion questions that I want you to consider. Answer at least one, but you may answer all three in the 10 to 15 minutes I'd like you to write about this. I want you to consider how far-reaching is this argument that Socrates presents? What does it purport to prove and does it prove too much? For instance, does it prove that no one would ever purposefully do harm to anyone else? Think about that. And secondly, whether you agree with it or not, what do you think is worth examining or taking seriously about this argument? What is worth taking seriously? What is insightful about it, even if it might not be right? And finally, if you had to be Miletus and challenge this argument, how would you do it? The most prominent argument that Socrates makes in his own defense during the Apology is an argument about the good life. 
may seem weird that in a criminal defense trial, someone would philosophize about what constitutes the good life. But the reason why it's an essential part of Socrates' defense is because he seems to be making the case that his role in Athenian society is to make that society good or worthwhile. And in order to do that, he needs to make the case that individuals, in order for them to lead a good life, a worthwhile life, a life of value and meaning, they must do precisely what Socrates is doing in Athenian society. They must have some person inside of their own mind playing the role of Socrates. To get to that conclusion, I want to take a little bit of a detour and discuss with you in class about what you think motivates individuals in life. I know that's a big question, but let's simplify it a little bit by categorizing three different kinds of things that we see people pursue all the time as they go through life. Those three things I'm going to categorize as material wealth, social wealth, and power. Material wealth is very familiar. Money, cars, houses, vacation, all of the things that money can buy or the things money can't buy but can be possessed materially. Stuff. Stuff you own. Social wealth is the kind of thing that people seem to be pursuing when they establish YouTube channels, Instagram, other social media, and it's what people who pursue fame seem to be after. Some people don't pursue fame, but other forms of esteem from, uh, from their colleagues, uh, from people that they care about. I'm going to call all of that stuff social wealth. And finally, power is the ability to exert influence over other individuals and things. Material wealth, social wealth, and power, more often than not, in our society, go together. If you have one of these, you probably have some of the others. But it's not true that they're the same kind of thing. You can think of examples of people who forego fame, rather not have any of it, but acquire lots and lots of wealth. Like people who are behind the scenes that you never heard about running financial institutions. Or you may imagine that there are individuals who like power so much that they forego wealth and esteem just to have it. I just saw a movie. The movie was called We Bought a Zoo with Matt Damon. Um, not a great movie. Okay. There was a character in it that I found pretty familiar. The character was a zoo inspector that everybody was afraid of because the zoo inspector would go around inspecting zoos, closing them down for petty reasons. I call these people petty tyrants. They like being in control, but they aren't liked and they know that they aren't liked. They don't have much social wealth and zoo inspectors don't make a lot of money. They don't have much material wealth, but you can find petty tyrants as building inspectors, zoo inspectors, bouncers at clubs. These are people who strive for power. But I digress. I would like us to discuss these things for a little bit, just as young people, although I'm not that young. I want you to consider questions like this. How much of human activity do you think is driven by these three things taken together? Say, if you had to estimate from zero to 100%, how much of what people do, people around you, do is in pursuit of these goods? And once you have your guess, your answer that we can talk about, whether it's high or low, I want you to consider this question. Are these things good? Are they worth pursuing? I want an honest answer. 
I don't want you to say something that you think you should say because it'll make you look better or look good in front of other people. I want you to answer as honestly as you can. Do you think these things are good? Do you think these things are worth pursuing? And I want you to talk about how you think we should even answer that question. What should we even think about when we think about whether these things are good or worthwhile pursuits in life? Please take another 10 minutes to write your thoughts about this and bring them to class so we can have an extended discussion of it. I'd like to see the range of answers that all of you are giving to this question. And once you do that, we're going to move on to complete the apology. In the apology, Socrates seems to be arguing that the different goods of life, material wealth, social wealth, power, are not the things that make for a good life. A good life has to do with the goodness of the soul that is experiencing the life. It is not the quality of the experiences themselves or the things acquired by that soul. Socrates seems to have a point. Somebody who lacks all of these different things, somebody who lacks wealth, the impoverished, people who lack social wealth, people who are never famous, and people who lack power, but who have a good soul, whatever that means to you, and we can talk about what that means soon. If you have a good soul, I think it's very hard for the rest of us to argue that they do not have a life worth living. Rather, they have a good life, perhaps even a better life, than somebody who has a bad soul, but who has acquired all of the material, social wealth, and power that anyone could acquire in their lifetime. There are individuals like that, but they have a poor or bad soul. And as a result, there's a good case that they are not living a worthwhile or good life. Not a life to be admired, looked up to, or one that we should be pursuing ourselves. So one of the premises of Socrates' defense is that the goodness of a life consists in the goodness of the soul of the person having the life. And the next premise is that these things that are considered goods, like money, wealth, and power, are not actually good unless they are possessed by people who are good, people who have good souls, people who are, to use the Greek word, virtuous. Socrates makes another good point here. People who are not virtuous, but who possess wealth, power, and fame, rather than being good, they can be, quite frankly, very scary. You can use material wealth, fame, and power to do very egregious things in the world if you lack virtue. The next step of Socrates' argument is that in order to possess virtue, to possess the kind of thing that Euthyphro was trying to define last time, virtues such as patience, discipline, knowledge. You need to have wisdom. What is the pursuit of wisdom? Well, philosophy is the Greek word for love of wisdom. The pursuit of philosophy is the pursuit of wisdom. Philosophy for the ancient Greeks wasn't this highfalutin field that you have to take college classes to learn. It was just anybody who was engaged in pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. So it follows from Socrates' argument that in order to live the good life, you have to, you have to practice philosophy. There's this famous quote from the Apology. It says that wealth does not bring about excellence, but excellence makes wealth 
and everything good for men, both individually and collectively. The idea is that all of these other goods, in fact, any other good that you can have, are not themselves good, but are made good by excellence. And that word excellence really is the Greek word arete, or in virtue. Virtue, possessed by the soul, is what makes all of the other goods good. It makes all the other things that are good for a life actually good for a life. Give somebody wealth, fame, or power, and it doesn't become good unless you add virtue. And for Socrates, virtue is acquired through wisdom, and wisdom through philosophy. And what does philosophy mean in this context? Philosophy means the examination of whether goods are good or worthwhile, the, so the seeking after of definitions of the virtues. It doesn't mean anything all that fancy. It means exactly what he was doing with Euthyphro. This leads Socrates to argue one of the most interesting and profound cases that he makes to the Athenian citizens. If Socrates is right, and that the pursuit of wisdom, the pursuit of questions like, is this life worthwhile? And are these things worthwhile? If that is indeed what constitutes a good life, then Socrates, at 70 years old, has a good life. He has a good soul. That soul cannot be harmed or corrupted by somebody who is looking to prosecute him unjustly. His conscience is clear. His soul is pristine. He's not worried about what would happen to him. But if Miletus and the citizens of Athens successfully convict him and then kill him, they are perpetrating an injustice. That is damaging to their souls. By perpetrating an injustice, they are doing more harm to themselves than they are doing to Socrates. In fact, if you zoom out and look at it from the perspective of the city, without individuals who are questioning those in authority, so that the city as a whole can pursue goods wisely rather than blindly. The city is doing itself a disservice because it's corrupting its own soul. In fact, I think Socrates is arguing that there is a double injustice that the city is doing to itself. It's wrongly convicting someone Therefore, thereby corrupting its own soul. And it's doing so thinking that it's right when they're wrong. So they're doing it ignorantly. Being both ignorant and wicked is a double crime. It's a double corruption of the soul. And so when Socrates, in all of the more fun parts of the Apology, says that his sentence should be a reward rather than execution. When he says he is the wisest person in Athens because he knows that he knows nothing. Part of the reading that you can have is that Socrates is being quite cheeky, snide, and passive aggressive. I think that's a legitimate reading. But I think there's a reality to the charge that when the state perpetrates an injustice, the innocent is most certainly harmed physically, their bodies, but their souls are not. But the injustice done by an individual corrupts 
that very individual. It corrupts their soul and turns them wicked. And that's precisely the kind of thing that Socrates is asking the Athenians to defend themselves against. And so we have this famous quotation from the Apology. The unexamined life is not worth living. Think about these issues. Think about that quotation and what it says and what it means to you. Write about it and bring it to class with you. <laughs>